So that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at some leadership lessons from Jesus. We're going to be checking out this passage from Matthew 14 that we just heard and the events that lead up to that passage as well. We're going to check out that a little bit. It's on page 928 of the Church Bibles. If you want to keep those open, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be tracking with that passage as we go. But let me pray for us before we start. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for church family here this morning. We thank you that you're a God who loves to speak to us and to communicate with us. We thank you that you're a God who loves to train us and teach us. And Lord, we're sorry for the times that we've hardened our heart and we haven't listened and we've made little of your word. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would send your Holy Spirit in power on your people. We pray that he would come this morning, that he would turn our hearts, our minds, our lives back towards Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first thing we need to get, the first thing we need to be clear about is that a disciple is a leader. A disciple is a leader. We were created to be leaders. If we go way back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we were created in God's image as leaders. God says to the first man and the first woman who ever existed, he says, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over every living creature that moves. Yeah, if it moves, rule over it. If it it moves, you're the boss. If it moves, you're in charge. We were created to be leaders. And because we're messed up and and we're a bit broken, leadership gets messed up and gets broken and it turns into things like control and domination and dictatorship. And when Jesus comes, he, he fixes leadership and he shows us what perfect leadership looks like. He shows us what leadership was always meant to be. Jesus shows us what leadership looks like when God is our leader. And being a disciple is about training to be a leader like Jesus. We read in Revelation chapter 20 that we will rule and reign with Jesus. We'll be kings with Jesus when he comes back. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12, we read that if we endure, if we keep on going to the end, we will reign with him. We'll be leaders with him when he comes back. Human beings are created for leadership. And it's in Jesus that leadership gets fixed gets made good, and then he offers it back to us as something for us to do. Being a disciple of Jesus means being in training to be a leader. And in some way, in some area of your life, in some aspect of what you're doing, that is what you are if you're following Jesus. You're a leader. And in in baptism and dedication this morning, that's what all of these guys have signed up for. That's what parents have signed their children up for. They've signed their kids up for the Jesus Leadership Course. Huge responsibility, but that's what they've done. So what kind of leader is Jesus? What kind of leader is Jesus? The passage we just heard from Matthew 14, we hear about Jesus walking on water and Peter walking on water. Uh, But before that, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. In fact, he hasn't fed the 5,000. He's got the disciples to feed the 5,000 because he's training them how to do the stuff that he does. And sometimes when we think about the feeding of the 5,000, we can think about some kind of big church picnic. Yeah, we can imagine that Jesus is doing some kind of like nice Sunday school teaching and then he's got that out of the way and, and now it's time for the bring and share lunch. Somewhere out in the countryside, they've got some nice scenery to look at. But actually, that's not what's going on here at all. Matthew draws our attention to the fact that there are 5,000 men. This is a very male crowd. And the other gospel writers tell us that these guys were sat around in 50s and 100s, which tells us that they were organized like an army. And John's gospel tells us that Jesus knew that this crowd wanted to make him king. So the feeding of the 5,000 is a long way from a harmless church picnic. You know, this is a group of 5,000 blokes out in the desert, possibly armed, possibly tooled up, ready for business. 
And they want Jesus to be their military leader. They want him to be the king who's going to lead them in in revolt against the Roman Empire. And Jesus says no. Jesus says no to that kind of leadership. Jesus resists the temptation to be the wrong kind of leader. Jesus resists the temptation to take charge in the wrong way, to be a leader who leads out of violence, to be a leader who leads out of force, to be a leader who leads out of bloodshed and the threat of weapons. He says no to all that. And he's, instead, he offers his disciples, he offers us a very different way of leading, a very different way of leading. So a disciple is a leader, and at this stage in their training as leaders, Jesus is showing his disciples, I think, three things that we can pull out about leadership, three leadership lessons that we're going to look at today. And the first is this, that leaders take responsibility. Leaders take responsibility. Jesus takes responsibility for other people's needs. Yeah, he's just fed these 5,000 people in the wilderness. These 5,000 men plus the women and children that were with them, he's just fed them. The disciples wanted to send them away. The disciples were like, no, send them out to the villages to get food. And Jesus says, no, we're going to take responsibility for feeding these guys. Jesus takes responsibility for the needs of others. And Jesus takes responsibility as well for other people's mistakes. He takes responsibility for the things that they do wrong. He takes responsibility for the things that they ought to do, but they don't. The Bible calls those things sin. And this crowd has got things really, really wrong about Jesus. You know, they are so mistaken in who they think he is and what he's come to do. And it would be really easy for him to just walk away, to just say that's their problem, to just leave them to it. But that's not what he does at all. Verse 22, where our passage starts, we read, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Jesus takes responsibility, first of all, for the disciples. He wants them out of the way of this kind of military-minded crowd so that they don't start to learn lessons from them instead of from him. And then he takes responsibility for the crowd, And he dismisses the crowd. He formally brings everything that's going on to a close so that they don't just go off and riot. They don't just go off and, uh, you know, looking for a fight with the Romans. He takes responsibility, even though it's their mistake. He takes responsibility. He doesn't wait for someone else to step up. And this is at the heart of Jesus' leadership. This is at the heart of of Jesus' leadership, taking responsibility, especially taking responsibility for the needs of others and for the mistakes of other people. And this is ultimately what Jesus is doing on the cross. On the cross, Jesus is taking responsibility for our biggest need to be put right with God. He's saying, yep, that's what you need and and I'll take care of that. I'll sort that out. I'll make that happen. And he's taking responsibility for all of our mistakes as well. He takes responsibility for all the sins of the world on the cross. He says, yes, they're not my mistakes, they're yours, but I'll take responsibility for them. I'll sort them out. I'll deal with them. So Jesus takes responsibility for the needs of others. He takes responsibility for the mistakes of others. And as well, he takes responsibility for training others. Jesus is always teaching. Everywhere he goes, he's always teaching, always showing the disciples how to be leaders. And if you're a parent or a godparent here today, then that's the responsibility that you've taken on. You've taken on the responsibility to train the children who we've dedicated and baptized today to be leaders like Jesus. And that might feel like that's a really big, overwhelming responsibility, but actually we just need to use the process that Jesus shows us. So first of all, I do, you watch. Let them see what life following Jesus looks like. Then I do, you help. We invite them to help us serve Jesus and serve his church. And then you do, I help. We invite them to take a lead in making stuff happen and we just help out to keep things on track. 
Let me give an example. A few years ago, I started up a men's Bible study, a men's breakfast Bible study. In fact, I did all the teaching and the other guys came along and ate bacon and watched or listened. Uh, hopefully, we all had a good time. That was, I do, you watch. And then I started to ask some of them to do some of the teaching and to take responsibility for making the meetings happen. I do, you help. And now someone else runs that Bible study. And other guys do the teaching and I just help out two or three times a term. You do I help. And this is how we see people learn. This is how we see people grow as disciples of Jesus. This is how we see people flourish as leaders in the church. And we can see this difference in this passage right there in Peter. When they were feeding the 5,000, Jesus had to tell Peter and the other disciples to feed the crowd. He had to tell them what to do. But now Peter doesn't have to be told. He wants to do the Jesus stuff himself. Yeah, there in verse 28, he says, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. I know what I want to do. I want to walk on water. I want to be like you. So Peter's seen what it means to be like Jesus, what it means to lead like Jesus, and he wants to lead like that. He's up for it. Leaders take responsibility. And second, leaders attempt the impossible. Leaders attempt the impossible. So Peter wants to do this stuff, and you can see the transition that he's made from being a learner to being a leader. He's looked at Jesus, he's seen what he does, he's seen who he is, he's found it attractive, he's found it positive, he's found it exciting. He's got to help out with Jesus' ministry, and now instead of just helping Jesus, he wants to do it himself. Doing the impossible. Leaders attempt the impossible, and we have to try as God's people, to do the impossible ourselves at some point. What's the point in only trying to do stuff which doesn't seem to need God? So let me encourage you today. Don't pull back on the size of your vision. Don't pull back on the size of your vision. Attempt the impossible. And the impossible will look different for all of us. For some of us, the impossible will be, how on earth do I raise children as disciples of Jesus in this city? For some of us, it will be, how do I be a leader for Jesus in my workplace, inviting people into God's kingdom? You know, when we have uh, baptisms here today, it's really easy sometimes to settle for a smaller vision. We're all splashing around in the pool, having lots of fun, lots of kids crying, it's all fantastic. And it's easy just to settle for the idea that we'll be happy if these kids grow up to be Christian believers. But I want to encourage us to have a bigger vision, maybe an impossible vision. That these kids would grow up to be fathers and mothers in huge, faithful Christian families that will transform the communities that they're a part of. Let's pray that these kids will grow up to bring hundreds of others to saving faith. Let's pray that these kids will grow up to be leaders in God's church. Let's not settle for a small vision. Let's pray for the impossible. I came to, to this church to SPS nine years ago. It's been an amazing nine years. I love it, and uh, Rick's amazing. He's an amazing uh, godly leader who's taught me loads. He's taught me how to be generous. He's taught me how to be patient. He's taught me how to be mindful of other people, all the sorts of things that come to him really naturally, but I really struggle with. Um, and there's been tons of miracles on the way, tons of stuff that just wouldn't have been possible without God. And back then, so 10 years ago, before I was following Jesus, I was always planning my life around what I could get for myself. Planning my life around what I could get for myself, what money I could earn, what status I could get at work, what promotion I could get at work, what pleasure I could get for myself, what fun I could have with the people that I was with. And as a result of that, where that showed most was in, in my finances. The biggest item of expenditure for me after my mortgage was my holidays. You know, twice a year, 1,200 quid, that was nearly 2,500 pounds a year on holidays. That was the biggest item of expenditure in my budget. Now my life is planned around what I can do for Jesus and his church. 
And the biggest item of expenditure in my budget is my giving, and that's a miracle. That's a miracle. But the real miracle is that when everything was focused on me, I was sort of happy and, and life was okay. But when God turned everything upside down and focused everything on Jesus, then I have to say I've never known the contentment that I know now. I've never known the excitement that I know now. I've never known before the joy that I experience now. Impossible. Impossible. And that work's still ongoing, miracle after miracle after miracle, the work that God's doing, transforming me into someone who one day will be able to rule and reign with Jesus when he comes back. And I know that lots of us here have got stories about how God has changed us. How God has changed us. And it would be very easy, especially on a day like today, for us to settle for this. You know, we look around and we see that this is a great church. And lots of us have got great friendships here. You know, you're a great bunch of guys to hang out with. We can have a great life together. But sometimes God calls us to more. Sometimes God calls us to the impossible. And so a couple of years ago, I felt that God was calling me to step into more, to step into the impossible, to step into stuff that I couldn't do for myself. Maybe take on more responsibility for making disciples, aim for more of the impossible. So over the last couple of years, I've been training for ordination in the Church of England. And doing that because I think God wants me to focus more and more on growing the church in Tower Hamlets. Growing the church here in East London. And growing the church in this area looks impossible. It looks impossible. Yeah, the sort of general philosophy that people have here, secular hedonism, is very powerful. People organize their lives around, you know, their pleasure and their holidays and their nights out and their, 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 their leisure time. Islam's very strong. Churches are largely small. People don't stay here for very long. They move through on their way to somewhere else. And growing the church here in East London looks like an impossible vision. It looks like an impossible vision. Sometimes I think we might as well try and walk across Shadwell Basin as try and grow the church and make disciples here in East London. But that's what we've been put here to do. We are the people that God has put here to grow the church in East London. To be leaders in growing the church here in East London. Maybe that's in families, making disciples out of your children. Maybe that's at work, inviting people into the kingdom. But leaders attempt the impossible. Leaders attempt the impossible. And attempting the impossible means that sometimes we will fail. Sometimes we will fail. And leaders learn from failure. Leaders learn from failure. Winston Churchill once said, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And Sarah Dessen, the American author, said, anyone who attempts is not a failure. Those who truly fail are the ones who never try at all, the ones who sit on the couch and whine and moan and wait for the world to change for them. Jesus teaches us, leaders take responsibility. Leaders attempt the impossible. And leaders learn from failure. And in the passage from Matthew, Peter's walking on water, and Peter learns what failure is all about. He had some success, and then it all goes pear shaped. But he learns through failure, he learns to trust Jesus. He learns to reach out to Jesus. He learns that Jesus is there. He learns that he can start again with Jesus back in the boat. Verse 29, Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Peter learns he can do the impossible if Jesus is there. Peter learns he doesn't need to worry when it doesn't work out if Jesus is there. 
Peter learns that he doesn't have to stop trusting. He can keep trusting. He can keep having faith because Jesus is there. Jesus has got a hand out. Jesus is ready to lift him back into the boat. Jesus is ready to teach him what he needs to know. Leading well means trusting Jesus with everything, even when everything's going really badly, especially when everything is going really badly. And I wonder if God is teaching us this as a community, leaders learn from failure. When things aren't going so well, we learn. You know, in this church, we've had a, a number of challenges recently. We've had financial challenges. We've had some spiritual challenges. We've got lots of people struggling with illness at the moment and people who are bereaved. Lots of things that ought to tempt us, that could tempt us to despair or to depression some of us today have taken on the challenge of, of discipling the children who were baptised. And there'll be times when, when we get that wrong. There'll be times when we let those kids down. Sometimes we'll fail. But leaders learn from failure. Leaders learn from failure. So failure isn't a time for us to stop taking responsibility for each other and for our neighbours. Because leaders take responsibility and failure isn't a time to step back from attempting the impossible vision that God's put in front of us because leaders attempt the impossible Jesus has taken responsibility for all of us and nothing is impossible with God so failure becomes a time when we can trust Jesus it becomes a time when we can reach out and take his hand, even as we're sinking down into the water. We can trust that his hand is there and that he'll lift us back into the boat. Taking responsibility, attempting the impossible, learning from failure. That's what leadership's all about when Jesus does it. Shall we stand?